Okay, so uh, to give Gaetan the possibility to give the second talk in his series of talks. So, so thank please. you, Leonia. So Marta and uh, say that it was good if I review a little bit some simple example of VOAs. So it will be a bit review of what we've seen at the end of last talk, but a bit expanded. And because of that, so the idea that we still keep a, a pace which is not too fast. So what I understood from the email exchange activity is going to be a fourth talk. Um, so, so we don't have to hurry today. Okay, so examples of VOA. So that you have a hand on how to work with that. So last time I've presented the Heisenberg VOA. And there's in fact an even simpler VOA, which is a Vera Soro VOA. I won't really need it. So secretly Vera Soro is W, the W algebra for SL2. And in all the talk afterwards, I would rather use WGLR, but it's, it's some of the simplest example that one can give. So um, Vera Soro of C, it's a Lie algebra, which is a central extension of the, of the Lie algebra of uh, diffeomorphisms of the circle. So it's spanned by some LN indexed by integers with relations LM with LM commutes to N minus M, LN plus M, C over 12, N L squared minus one, delta N plus M zero. So C is a fixed parameter. And out of this, you can build a VOA. So how is that working? What you're going to do is to introduce the space V to be the span of some polynomials in the negative generators. Um, so you can think there's just abstract vectors depending on some K non-negative and then N1 bigger than et cetera, then bigger than NK. And that will have a structure of a VOA. So what we want to do is to define a map from V to formal series valued infinite in both sides of endomorphisms of V. And so what do we do? We associate to L minus one zero. Yeah, then I suppose you meant uh, NK, NI is greater than uh, zero. I also mean all of them are positive. Yes, thanks. Yeah. So this one I'm going to call T and it will be sent to LN over Z N plus two. So indeed that's a series of endomorphisms uh, because that thing here, it's acted open by the Lie algebra VRC by declaring that LN on zero for n positive is zero. Um, and for n negative, uh, well, then you have to commute all of this. So when you want to act with some LN, just commute it through here and you get finally to zero where this is killed. And so you have an action here. So this is for L minus one. And if you want to know what is, um, the action on some L minus one, L minus N K on zero. So this we call T of Z. Um, you use this reconstruction formula, which I, I wrote last time for the Heisenberg VOA. That's also what you want to do here. So you do this product of D N I minus one Z and I minus one factorial, and then here T of Z. And this normal ordered product means that you put the, so this is a sum of monomials if you just take the naive product. And in each of this monomial, you're going to put to force 
um, to move the negative, the positive modes. To the right, and so that defines this map Y for any vector in V, and this is a VOA structure. So what we've seen last time was when you were taking so H, which is CR that you think as the carton for GLR. And so this had a certain killing form. And I was forming, so not the virus algebra, but the, the Heisenberg algebra, H hat. So you're just putting, um, Going to call that X, perhaps X or Z. So you form this loop space, and um, if I have some element psi in H, and we denote psi n to just be psi tensor X to the n, and you can look. Oh, and I want that plus an extra generator, K. And inside there you have H minus, uh, just taking the negative powers. And then you can form again the space V, which is symmetric polynomials in these negative uh, elements. So this is just a formal notation. There's a vector and the others you denote in like a polynomial time this vector. And this was having a structure of VOA. So, X. Um, and how do we do that? I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so for H hat, do you really want infinite series in both directions? I'm not going to uh, dwell on these questions. I don't think it makes much of a difference at this stage. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, actually, yeah, if I take these symmetric polynomials, I don't really want completions here. So um, I don't want the, the infinite ones. Um, this is not going to be too important. I can, I'm going to neglect in all the talk this completion or not issues, because at the end things work if you do it the right way. So what you do here to define this y is whenever you have something in degree minus one, you send it to psi n over x n plus one. And if you want sign this product here, you use again the reconstruction formula, the same one. So is this one. Okay. So as I said, these are intermediate steps for what we really want to consider is W algebras. And so WGLR, the several ways to define it, and what I'm going to give is not the original definition, but at the end it's it was it is proved to be equivalent. Um, is that you're going to consider WI, which is the elementary symmetric polynomial. Of chi one minus one chi r in degree minus one of zero, oh, sorry. sorry. 
Yeah, this is inside the elementary symmetric. So this is indeed a symmetric polynomial. And these chi's is an orthonormal basis on the carton. Um, and then what you do, so you can look at the corresponding wiz, which is what this map y attached to this wi. It has a certain decomposition in two modes. And then, um, in fact, what happens that this W is the VOA uh, strongly generated by this. That means that it's the, the vector space that you want is the, and actually in that case, it's also freely generated. There's no relations. Um, is that you take things of this type. So these are endomorphisms um, on the vector space V. And so you can apply to a vector, you get vectors and you take the span of all of that. And that's going to be the space that has the VOA structure just by restricting the one that we have here on the Heisenberg. So you could say this is a subspace of the Heisenberg VOA, which I have defined here. Good. And that's what we want to work with. And what is really important so, for sorry, us, the eyes, the superscript eyes range from uh, one to zero R. to R. One to R. From one to R. Well, it's also easier. Yeah. And what we're really interested in with this is A, which is a suitable completion of the algebra of modes. The, the modes being these ones. So you look at all polynomials you can form in the WKI. Some of them could be infinite. There's some issue of completion I don't discuss. And this is an associative algebra. Good. And the point where we use really the VOA structure apart from these very concrete formulas that have uh, the right property to be a VOA is because to construct area structure, we want to construct ideal, what I call graded ideals. In A. So for the point, the property two in area structures, um, we wanted to find some, so I would say that I, We want I, let's say, which is a subset of modes. So modes, it's indexed by an I, which is between one and R and some integer. Uh, and we say generating a graded Lie ideal if when you consider AI, which is the span of all those modes. So when you commute two of them, you're going to get this. So it doesn't close, but up to right left multiplication by A, uh, you land in AI. So I say it's a great Lie ideal because then you can look at the ideal in A generated by AI 
that is a times a i. And then if you commute two of two such, uh, you want it to be in a j bar, a times a i. So that's what we really want to find because that tells us, okay, uh, a good set of operators that satisfy these consistency constraints. So here's the lemma. So before the lemma, I need some notation. So let lambda one, lambda p be a partition of R. And we're going to denote lambda bracket uh, I to be the minimum of all integers so that when we sum the lambda i's up to, so lambda j is up to m, and this is big or equal to i. So it's another way to encode the partition by saying where are the jumps of this sequence of the partial sums. And I can state the lemma that for any, so this is something that we proved in a paper with Bouchard, Kreutzisch, Shidambaram, who should be before Kreutzisch. But I must say that this particular lemma comes from representation theory of W algebras. And this is really um, using the inside of Thomas Kreutzisch. Noshenko. And um, it's mean that for any such lambda, if you define I lambda to be the set of I K So you only take those modes so that K plus lambda bracket I is positive, that generates a graded Lie ideal in the above sense. There's two particular examples that were known before. It's not very hard to check from the axioms of VOA. So you have this trivial partition. In that case, what is I lambda? Well, lambda I, there's not much space. So this is all the case positive. So if you just take the non-negative modes, you do get a Grady Lee ideal. Because in that case, the lambda um, you see, since you just have one row, uh, the only value of m is one, and it's true for any i. And since I have a strict inequality here, it gets that I have all the k's non-negative and all the i's possible. So you have the other, the opposite case, where just one column. So in that case, the lambda bracket i is just i is a set of k, which is bigger or equal to i minus one. So it's sometimes called the vacuum ideal and as a conformal ideal, because i is the conformal weight, it's the eigenvalue of L0 for uh, wi. Okay. So we're going to use, we want some of the Bayesian area structure on these ideals. Um, so what we don't have yet is we would like a representation of these modes into differential operators. So then that starts to really look closer to an array structure, what an array structure is. So I think this is point three. This is free field representations. Doesn't it doesn't mean anything else than just representation into differential operators? Okay. And in in doing this construction, in fact, uh, 
when we when we are going to use a freedom to use a twisting by some automorphism of this WGLR. And I should stress here when I wrote this, this is WJR at a very specific central charge. For different central charge, there's also a description, um, not in terms of just EI like this. It's called the Mura transform. And what I do here, you can also, uh, something we do in currently, you can also do for all the central charges, but I will just stick um, to this very specific central charge. And for that very specific central charge, um, this automorphism group, uh, it contains the vial group of GLR, which is sigma R. And to simplify, I will first treat the case, I will give the details for the case where sigma is the full cycle. So there's an action of sigma on the Cartan algebra, which is just take this orthonormal basis and it permutes it cyclically. And now I'm going to define H hat sigma where, so the little difference is if you want to um, use that somehow to twist new VOA, um, what you're going to do is to allow also fractional powers of Z or what I called X before. And so therefore I, I will call that Z. So you write X equal like this. And here, so this is H C X to the power one over R. And again, I don't worry too much about whether I complete or not. And on this, we can induce an action of sigma by saying that if I have psi tensor x to the n over r, you do the natural thing. You, uh, you think that this sigma is going to give the monodromy of this x to the n over r. And so I have theta n um, and here x to the n over r, where theta is a primitive root of unity. So let, let's take this one. Okay. So now what we're going to actually to construct is a twisted representation of the Heisenberg VOA that I denoted V. Uh, and what is a twisted representation? It's, so first a representation, if you had the module, uh, you would go from V to all the morphisms of this module to the X in row. So that would be a certain uh, representation. But now I want to do twisted. So here I allow negative powers. And the particular module that I want is going to be V sigma, where V sigma is constructed by the negative part of H sigma. And we're going to define it uh, a bit. So how, how do we do that? So this is, I can see it as formal functions on some variables x1, x2, x3. Uh, all what I do somehow, I always extend my field to have some formal parameter h bar. 
It's also for both series in H bar. Um, okay. And so the only thing I need to do is to say how the Heisenberg are, um, all the generators of the Heisenberg are acting. Uh, so for this, we first uh, go to a diagonal basis. So Gaetan, just a, yes. a quick question. Yes. So um, I'm trying to make contact with familiar stuff. So the X's here, this is an infinite series of X's. Should this somehow rather be view, viewed as some kind of bosonic Fox space? With yes, the X's? This, is, this is a bosonic Fox space. And the X's are like the uh, KP flow variables? Uh, yes, they are up to normalization. Okay. So you can go to a diagonal basis for the action of sigma by Fourier transform. So first you do that on H. So on H. So if you define VA for A from one to R to be some of, so you have your chi, your chi j, which is your orthonormal basis, which is cyclically permuted. And then you put the, this root, r root of unity into the power minus a j. This has the probability that sigma of v a is theta a v a. And if I want, I can go, I can write conversely that chi j by inverse Fourier transform is one over R theta A J V A. So instead of defining the Y sigma here uh, for the thing generated by the chi, I'm going to define it for field generated by the by the Vs. And I can pass from one to the other by this Fourier transform. So what you do is that this Y sigma V A Z, which I'm simply going to denote V A of Z, is going to be the sum over all the not integers but fractional integers with residue A, and then J R K Z to the K, sorry X to the K. So it's a uh, it contains fractional powers plus one. And my j, so that should be some endomorphisms of this Fox space. I want it to be so now because I multiply by r, all of those are integers. So for k positive, it's going to be the derivative. For k equals zero, it's going to be zero. And for k negative, it's multiplication by x minus k, except there's some normalization here, which match with the definition I took of the Heisenberg Lie algebra. And precisely because of that, because that respects the Heisenberg commutation relation, um, this is, so this plus, the reconstruction formula that tell you what is this. Uh, I don't rewrite it. It's the same as before. That was this formula. Uh, that defines a sigma twisted representation of this Heisenberg VOA on V sigma. And now we restrict it 
to a representation of WGLR, which sits inside there. So we get that our WIs are going to be decomposed like this. And now the interesting point is that this is untwisted because WIs were elementary symmetric polynomials in the field generated by the Xi i's. And these one are cyclically permuted under the automorphism. So you're not going to be able to have any monodromy. Um, and therefore you only have integer powers. Good. So now we do have these things are some differential operators. And this construction is by no, mean, no means new. It's the usual free field representation just with this all default um, twisting coming from sigma. They are local, local differential operators, not exponentials. They're local, yes. They, they are not vertex operators. Okay, so we would like to compute them explicitly. So what do we do? We know what is Wix is a normal ordered product of the EI chi one. So it will be of chi one X chi R X. And uh, as we said, we prefer to work with the VA basis with the Fourier transform, so we can write one over R to the I, and then sum over all these indices, and then we would have this minus A1, minus two A2, minus R A R and then the normal ordered product of the V A's. The V A's being here. And so we can compute, insert that here. And the only thing that we have to worry about is this normal ordered product. So if we just had two VAs, so maybe I call it Z1 and Z2, um, so you can express the usual product into the normal order product, just defer by some order of monomials. It's a little computation in the Heisenberg algebra. I'll just give you the result. You get an H bar because in the Heisenberg algebra, we have this H bar in the commutation relation. We decided it, it to be so. You have a delta from R of A1 plus A2. So it's only non-zero when R divides A1 plus A2. This is coming from the fact that in the Heisenberg commutation relation, the, the factor that you have when you commute to is a scalar product. And this scalar product is uh, delta R A plus B. And there's a factor of R, if I remember. And here you have DZ2. So that's coming from the computation. Z2 or Z1. A1 over R, 
So that's the one that you may have to move some modes to the right divided by Z1 minus Z2. And more generally, if you want now the normal ordered product of, uh, of uh, R of them, uh, you have some weak theorem. You can obtain it uh, by some summing over pairs where you have you would have such factors um, and then the remaining normal ordered products. So this is the idea behind the formula I'm going to write. So it's the answer. So it's over X. Yeah. It's one over R thing to the I. Then you have the sum over J's, which is the number of pairs you're going to, to have from this weak theorem. There's some combinatorial factor. And then you have the sum over the A's, which some of you already had over here. There is some combinatorial factor that depends on the A's, which I'm going to write in a minute. Um, there is some H bar okay, here. So the H bar X minus two to the power J. And finally, the normal ordered product of this V A L X. Where Psi, it's a sum over roots of unity. Gita, is this somehow a generalized Sugawara formula? Yes, it is. If you just do it for Virasaro, you will find the usual quadratic um, expression. But there's also linear in these. Uh, there's a derivative term in the Sugawara. Uh, that's because you do it for general central charge, I think. If you do it for this very specific central charge, you don't have them. So this term is coming from this normal ordered product from the weak theorem. Okay. So I wrote it to show you this is explicit. In general, you cannot go much better. I mean, for J equals zero, this can be computed. For J equal one as well, but I don't have a general formula for any for any j. But certainly because it's a sum over all the, the Galois conjugates under the cyclic group, uh, this must be a rational number. Good. So the only virtue of this formula so far, uh, it's what you're going to compute with, but it, it shows you that it's you can really work with that. It's an explicit differential operator. Um, but you may notice that it's a differential operator of degree i, exactly. It's homogeneous because h bar, remember that my h bar has degree two and my x i have degree one. So somehow since the v's had, um, and everything was, I mean, it was graded algebra. So since the v's were of degree one, I take the product of i of them. So I have something of degree, of degree i. And it's not quite what we want for an airy structure because we need to have this uh, non-homogeneous part where the degree one part is just a derivative. So this is a last it's step. Done, sorry. Yes. So, and uh, j just to make it uh, clear, and you always have um, basically infinite number of, uh, of variables here. Yes, exactly. And so that's why you have to consider some sort of completion. 
Uh, at the end, what matters is that its action on any given monomial in the Fox space is well defined. And from that, you can infer which completion to consider. And that's the case for what I do. So just, just to get a flavor of it. So yep. each, each, it's like Virasur, right? Each W is a finite sum of a finite number of derivatives with respect to X with polynomial coefficients. Is that correct? Um, uh, I don't think it's a finite sum. No, it's no, no, finite no, no. order, but. If you want, so for, Vira, for the Virasur case, for example, the LN is going to, to involve yeah, JK, JK plus yeah, N. And so it's a finite band matrix. Okay, I'm sorry. It's an infinite sum over the, the derivations, but the coefficients are polynomials, right? Yes. Good. So the last step that we have to do is what you can call the dilaton shift. Um, and that is strategy of Milano of that somehow Milano of that uh, somehow in this work with Bouchard. So all what I'm telling you here uh, can be found in, in, in this paper. And um, so we general we systematize the approach of Milanov to do this. Um, so the idea is simply that we have some variables xks, k positive, and let's just shift them. So you can say, let's shift J minus S, which is uh, S, X minus S for some S positive. And let's shift it by a constant. So just one, you could choose more uh, J's to, nor more X to, to shift by a constant. We're going to come to that later. But at least let's try to make it work for, for this. Um, so then indeed it breaks homogeneity. Um, in particular, the W I K when I do this shift is going to get a priori degree zero term just a constant plus some degree one terms so some x's and some h bar zero dx plus higher order term can you just say some motivation what is the significance of this dilaton shift uh, that's what i'm going to explain now uh, so first in every structure remember that we wanted something that has degree one of a very specific form and higher orders uh, so far, we are quite happy about these modes W, A, K, because we know that we can get some ideals from them by choosing just certain modes, like the positive modes, for instance, that was a, forming a graded ideal. And we also have them to be differential operators, but we, we, they don't, they're homogeneous of degree I, so they don't have the required form to be an error structure. So if you want to get an error structure, you have to break homogeneity. That's what you do here. But there's a tension. Because um, there should be no x, and that excludes. So depending on s, it excludes some i k. So no x and also no degree zero term. Um, so you want you don't want to take a lot of modes. But if you take, uh, you still have to take modes forming a graded ideal. And usually when you commute two modes, you will get something on the right hand side and you want them at least to contain to the right some of the, some of the modes that you restricted to. So you have to take enough modes. So what you're aiming at is your airy uh, operators should be somehow a subalgebra of the double algebra, W algebra? Um, 
Not exactly a subalgebra. Well, you could say that the ideal generated in the algebra of associative modes by the uh, by these modes is a graded subalgebra. There should be an H bar when you commute to with this property here. You want that. So you have to choose the I, so just the most, a certain subset of modes, so that you have this property. And that requires whenever you have two modes, you commute, you obtain something. That requires that it, it must, this thing must be big enough so that your commutator lands in it. And not only that, we also wanted that WIK for the selected mode, it should start, it should start like this. Plus higher order with pi being in bijection with this and positive integers. Because we want each variable to appear once and only once in WKI. So that means that you also should take n of most so that each of these positive d or dxk appears in exactly one of these wik. And so there's a tension between the choice of s and the choice of most that you keep that is the upgraded the ideal that we've seen, which at least we have some indexed by partitions. Maybe there exist others, but at least we have those ones. Um, so this is the content of the theorem. So in this five author paper, that assume S is positive. Uh, and then, so what you find is that uh, you look, so here you have certain, you can compute that for any I and K. And then you're going to find, yes, it has this form only if I select a certain set of modes. So it's the set of modes that you take is, if I remember the set of IK such that S I minus one plus RK is positive. So then you have that with some coefficients I don't really care about because I kind of will renormalize and we scale operator. Um, so for exactly this map. Um, is an area, so this is after shifting, is an area structure, if and only if, um, so first I will put a slightly stronger assumption here and I will comment on it after. So S is bounded by R plus one. So within that, if and only if R is congruent to plus or minus one modulo S. So you certainly want that R and S are co-prime because otherwise this map cannot be a bijection. So you maybe have a set of modes, but you're missing some derivative respect to some variable, so it cannot be an airy structure. But this condition here is stronger and it's quite surprising in fact. So the simplest case excluded where R and S are co-prime is seven, five. Um, so if you do that, what you would find here is that you in fact don't have, a, you're not in this IRS. So what happens there, IRS is not 
of the form I lambda. Um, you could say, so what? I still have IRS, which is a well-defined set. Maybe it doesn't belong to the ideals I already know, but maybe this is still an ideal. And the fact it's an if and only if comes from the fact you can actually prove this is not an ideal. And in fact, cannot be an ideal. And the way you prove that is that if it were an ideal, F03, which in the corresponding partition function of the Erbe structure should be symmetric. Um, so K1, Km. So if you have an ideal, then you know you have an error structure, therefore this thing must be symmetric. And you can explicitly compute F03. Um, it's two pages of arithmetic and you find indeed it's not symmetric unless R is has this congruence relation. So I do a one minute break and I come back. Okay, so that's you um, and that's what I will call the basic error structures. And it classifies what you can obtain from using the twisting to be the full cycle. So from these basic cases, you can obtain a large family of other area structures using symmetries of area structures. It's something we briefly talked because there were questions at the end of the previous talk, but now I'm going to explain it in greater detail. Um, so, if we have an area structure, so some operators that I denote H. So, okay, this thing here, let us denote it H pi i k, because then I know these ones are just positive integers. So if I have H uh, M or H P, um, I can always conjugate that. And then the corresponding partition function, which is killed by all the HP, is just going to be multi, I mean, to be U applied to Z. And U, what we can take is an automorphism of the Weyl algebra. So here's the Weyl algebra of this space, V sigma, of the space of functions. Um, Okay, but when I do that, so what does something like that looks like? Well, you can take the corresponding exponential. Uh, but in general, it's 
also what I write here is certainly true. The, the still a partition function is given by U of Z. In general, U H P U is not an area structure. So of course, two, this ideal condition is still satisfied because it's just a conjugation. We just have an isomorphic ideal. But one, which is this probability that HP is H bar zero DXP plus higher order may fail because uh, for instance, you could do DXP, which is minus XP, XP to be H bar DXP, for example, doesn't respect. But what always work is if you look U of this form. So you could decide to conjugate by something I will denote uh, like this, and it will be in the next talk that the notation is explained. So the partition function have no F02, no F01. So this is just a um, convenient notation. Um, so here I'm putting some normalization for convenience, H bar, and then I'm going to have JP1, JP2. And so what is this? Because I take only the positive guy, this is H bar zero DXP1, H bar zero DXP2. So at the end, this is something like that. Uh, and there's some coefficient. So this is symmetric, so I can always assume this is symmetric. I put a symmetry factor over two. And actually you could continue. You could also put higher order, pure differential operators. Um, what I want to include is also this linear differential operator. Um, so here, sum over p and minus p over p dxp. So this guy is a translation. It is sending xp to xp plus m01 minus p, which is a scalar divided by p. Because u on the partition function, it acts here. And this thing is exactly a translation of the original partition function. This part, what it does is take xp and add to it something like that. Uh, H, oops. H bar D over DX Q, and there might be some factor here. So here we translate by, by a scalar, here we translate XP by a differential operator, but it doesn't affect this part because it doesn't touch H bar zero DXP itself. Here there's a sum over Q. And that uh, you can it on, uh, yes. just sorry, uh, just let you know that it's like two minutes. Yes, I plan to finish just after that. Okay. So to prove that, so you have to compute this conjugation of operators. You can do that by Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula. So operators of this form. Um, so this action here is always well defined. This one is not always well defined. Precisely because you have 
infinite sums in these operators. So their action on some polynomial is well defined. But if you, if now you decide to shift the variables here, since there can be infinitely many x that contribute, depending on the values of this f0, 1, you may have actual infinite sums, even when you want to act from this new operator on some polynomial. Um, but what you can prove is that if you only shift for p bigger than s, somehow you have shifted a basic guy, which was j minus s, so xs. Uh, by one, I could have put a constant that would just change this little factor, which is in front uh, here. So once you've done a basic shift, um, which is well-defined, then you can also shift all the higher guys as well, and this is still well-defined. So if this smaller than s minus one is, is, uh, is zero, then u h p u inverse is well defined and still forms an every structure. Therefore, the previous theorem which I showed, you could say in general, let's take um, the original WAK. And I want to shift variables, I mean, all, all possible variables. So I turn on all this F01, and there's a certain S, oops, which is the minimum of all the P such that F01 minus P is different from zero. And then the previous theorem tells you that yes, you get an error structure provided your R, your S satisfy a certain congruence relation with the R. And you get a whole family of every structures indexed by now all these possible F02s and the F01 of P's which are higher than some S. And they're all isomorphic somehow, correspond to isomorphic modules for the W algebra because it's given by conjugation. Parameterize by F01 and F02. And so I will stop here. Next time we'll see how to convert that into spectral curve description. Uh, okay, thank you, Gaetan. So very short uh, time for questions. So very first, short. thank maybe. And yes, yeah, so let's thanks first. Yeah. Uh, okay, now questions. So are you saying there always is a spectral curve? Yes. Great. <laughs> That's not what Leonid said, but okay. Um, so that's what I explain next time. Essentially, you always have local coordinate locally so that the spectral curve would be this. That's using the orbi folding. So the sigma we see that the Galois transformations of the cover. And the F01 coefficient F01, F02 that I write here are going to be the expansion of Y dx and omega 02 near z equals zero. But uh, what if uh, the number of variables is finite? How can you say? Is it a spectral curve or not? No. The fact that you have a spectral curve, so it means the ring of function is um, these local rings with this grading. Yeah. And so that's why here we write with these VOAs where you have this grading. If you don't have this grading, there's no spectral curve. Okay, so uh, let's at least uh, close uh, formally this session. So let's thank Gaetan again. But Gaetan, the, the, the very last point that you said, 
uh, I mean, it feels to me like uh, you kind of you don't really get a spectral curve; you get a germ of a spectral curve at this ramification point. Yeah. But what if what uh, uh, Lonya said uh, with finitely many variables? Maybe what if you have not the germ of a spectral curve at a ramification point, but rather you know uh, some kind of um, um, what do you call it? Uh, like a fat a germ of a fat point. So, uh, so you you have um, uh, you know c like c of z mod z to the to the d, yeah, some kind of scheme. So that's that's your local model. I mean, exactly. that's basically you're you're kind of recovering a local model here. Yeah, exactly. That, what you get from every structure in in naturally is not a global curve; it's a local curve where this is spec of mm -hmm. uh, x z with x is z to the r. Yeah. And um, if you have a global curve, so that's the, the point where it is useful, is that you can always just look at the local curve near the zeros of the X. Of course, yeah. And therefore you also have an area structure attached to the global curve. Of course. And TR on this, because TR is a local computation, amounts to, is encoded into the MGNs of this area structure. Of course, yeah. What, so what I'm suggesting is, uh, you see the the local com so you, you like you're computing spec of c x z mod uh, that ideal. But what if you uh, also uh, mod that ring out by um, what do you what do you do by uh, I guess x x to some power? So you you, what want, you have you want to get some points. Yeah, yeah. We, well, you. I mean, basically, you 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 no longer have a, a reduced. Uh, yeah, good point. Right. So would that correspond to what uh, Leonia suggested with finite, finitely? No, uh, with a finite, it doesn't no? correspond because still your curve is as infinitely many points. But remember that here, all what I explained was for this full cycle. And that exactly corresponds to the monodromy. I mean, to the. Mm, I see. Group. Now, if you take sigma, which is a product of cycles mm -hmm. of order summing up to R, so it's an Ri cycle, disjoint, then there's an analog of this theorem. Maybe I will just state the result at uh, the beginning of next week. But this theorem here of existence of every structure as an analog. That's something that we worked out with Rainier, Kramer, and Yannick Schuller. But the classification is much more complicated. Now you really have more constraint on what are possible dilaton shift you can do versus this ideal. There's always this tension. It's much more tricky to, uh, to, to characterize. But at least what you get here is this uh, non-reduced things. We have x minus z to the r mu. And the y, so normally in a curve you have p of x, y. So it's again going to have several factors. And the y, so if I say a little bit, it's going to behave like z to s mu minus r mu, where s mu is related to the dilaton sheet that you can do in each of these copies. And there's strong constraints on how S mu and R mu can be in order to get an every structure. Um, yeah, I guess I will say more next time. Thank you. I'm still around if some other people have questions. Uh, I guess if there is no more questions, we can stop now and sing Gaetan again. So thank you. And, uh, see you then next week. Yes, yeah, see you next week. Looking forward for the next talk. <laughs> <laughs>